Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Random Action. Welcome to the second part of the 1998 entry in my animated 90s series. We've almost made it through a whole new decade, so in a few weeks I'll be doing a 90s summary similar to what I did for the 80s series, and then next year we'll be moving on to something new. I hope you've all been enjoying some of the new series that I've launched here recently, like the Personnel Office, and I have a couple more in the pipeline as well. I've also got some plans for covering some other topics through a couple of live streams during the week, specifically games of both the tabletop and video variety, but I'll make a community post about those when I'm ready to roll them out. Keep an eye out if either of those topics interests you. Now though, let's pick up where we left off and see if we can close the book on 1998. We had a couple of series this year that felt to me like they'd fit here in the slice of life category, but I've never actually seen either of them except for what I watched while researching this video, so that's just my best guess. The first of these is called The Lion Hearts, a sitcom about a family of lions who are, oddly enough, based on the MGM Studios mascot. You know, this one. This was about, well, it was The Simpsons with lions. Parents, a son, two daughters, plus an occasional grandpa with a little softer edge. It also had a supporting cast of humans who worked at the studio, voiced by the likes of Joe Pantoliano, Betty White, and Wallace Shawn, while the main cast included Disney Channel staple Ashley Tisdale and Oscar nominee William H. Macy. The series ran weekend mornings for a single 13-episode season in syndication. The other one I'm putting in this category for the year is called The New Chucklewood Critters, and was actually born from a series of holiday specials created by former Hanna-Barbera animators Bill Hutton and Tony Love that first aired in 1983. It follows the daily adventures of a pair of young anthropomorphic woodland creatures, a bear cub named Buttons and a young fox named Rusty, through Chucklewood Park. They go to an animal school with an owl teacher and have a bunch of animal friends. I don't really know what else to say about it, as it seems pretty animals learning lessons in a forest typical, and I haven't really seen enough of it to say otherwise. I'm not even really sure what age group it was aiming for. It started as a collection of nine specials between 1983 and 1994 before becoming this series, which ran for 26 episodes across two seasons, but I have no idea where. The preschool crowd got a pair of new shows this year we'll touch on briefly as well. The Family Channel got one in the form of Franklin, about a young anthropomorphic turtle named, well, Franklin, obviously, and you know what? Just take what I said about Chucklewood Critters and apply it here. Pretty much the same idea. This one ran for 78 episodes across six seasons, with some heavy focus on sports and games. The other series from the year for the very young crowd came to the Disney Channel as part of its Playhouse Disney block with PB&J Otter. Again, we had some young anthropomorphs, this time in the form of a family of otters, living in the countryside town of Lake Hoo-Ha. I may be wrong here, but I kind of thought Hoo-Ha was slang for, uh, something else. My Hoo-Ha is full of joy. Anyway, the show was about three kids named Peanut, Butter, and Jelly, the titular PB&J of the title, going about their lives and learning things, just like every other preschool show ever made. Side note, their parents must have been really committed to the gag and in it for the long haul, since the older siblings are named Peanut and Jelly, with Butter being a significantly later addition. Gotta admire that kind of dedication. The series lasted for 65 episodes over three seasons. This next category is going to be a fairly quick one, and a little bit of a cheat considering the only show in it is done in claymation. I did mention it in a previous episode in this video series though, as it was born out of MTV's cartoon Sushi, which was in the 1997 lineup. It's called Celebrity Deathmatch, and was a spoof series about clay models of popular celebrities from the era brutalizing each other in no-holds-barred wrestling matches. It was probably one of the most late 90s shows ever made, considering the celebrities that, quote, appeared, unquote, on the show and a theme song by shock rock legends Marilyn Manson. It was pretty lowbrow and super violent, but I'll admit that my army buddies and I watched it all the time. There was just something appealing about matchups like Jim Carrey vs. Mariah Carey or Bill Gates vs. Michael Flatley that kept us coming back. This one got a massive 93 episodes over six seasons. That brings us to my catch-all category, which I shoved a trio of shows into this year. We'll start off with a new entry for the syndicated Bobot Kids Network programming block called Pocket Dragon Adventures. The show is based on characters designed by artist Rael Musgrave, most famously appearing as a line of small figurines called, well, Pocket Dragons. It's an anachronistic medieval slice of life sounding series, kind of in the vein of Smurfs, but following a group of six of the titular Pocket Dragons who live in a kindly old wizard's castle. Usually the episodes are about the dragons thwarting the schemes of some villain or another, often causing some kind of mess or chaos in the process, but learning a valuable lesson along the way. 
This is another one that I'm not exactly certain about the target age group for, but it ran in the BKN block for a single 52 episode season. Moving on, we get the Canadian import Bad Dog, which got 40 episodes across two seasons on Fox Family. The show is based on a, well, I guess we have to call him a character, that appeared in a screensaver collection called After Dark. Okay, so I said that Celebrity Deathmatch was peak 90s, but a show based on a screensaver of all things is probably a close second. Regardless, the show focused on the trouble caused by the eponymous Bad Dog, who was named Berkeley, kind of like the company that designed the screensaver, and who follows every command he's given with no concern over who gives it or the consequences of doing so. Also of note was that the father in the show was a bumbling inventor, which was a really odd kind of trend that happened with a lot of series throughout the 80s and 90s. And I say odd because I don't think I've ever met a professional wacky inventor in real life. The last series I want to put in this category was this year's entry into what seems to have become the recurring occurrences of showcase shows this decade. I just realized that that was two pairs of words that are either related to or based on the root forms of the same words, and I honestly didn't intend to do that. Anyway, it was this year's entry into those kinds of shows that have been popping up all over the decade with Nickelodeon's Oh Yeah cartoon. Seriously, we've pretty much gotten at least one of these a year since Liquid Television in 1991. This one, though, according to Wikipedia at least, was the largest of all of them, featuring 101 animated shorts from several dozen creators over its 24-episode three-season run. It also gave birth to the ongoing Nickelodeon cartoons The Fairly Odd Parents, My Life as a Teenage Robot, and Chalk Zone. Other than that, though, there's not really much else to say about this one either, so I'll go ahead and move along. Starting off this category, we have an animated primetime series from Steven Spielberg and Harvey Bennett called Invasion America. The show was produced by DreamWorks and ran on the WB for a single 13-episode season, which amounted to an entire self-contained story. The show followed an outcast teenager who didn't know he was a half-human, half-alien prince from a planet that was preparing to invade the Earth. The main character, David's father, was opposed to the invasion and deposed and eventually killed by the dissenters who disagreed with that stance, though not before fathering a child with a human woman. The local sheriff is a loyal retainer of David's father, who's been watching over the teen since birth and saves him when the dissenters finally track him down. What follows is a high-concept sci-fi story of opposing the invaders, navigating interactions with humans, and dealing with the military. Though it could be kind of slow at times, it was still an entertaining watch, and boasted some real sci-fi credibility from not only Spielberg, but the presence of Leonard Nimoy as one of the voice actors. Speaking of hidden wars and conspiracies, the next show I've got to talk about here is called The Secret Files of Spy Dogs, and ran for 22 episodes on Fox Kids over two seasons. The series was built around the concept that dogs were members of a secret agency called the Spy Dogs that defended the world and their owners without humans ever knowing what was happening. I feel like that's treading fairly close to the same ground that Road Rovers covered earlier in the decade, but without the supersuits. The spy dogs are led by the enigmatic Dog Zero, voiced by Batman great Adam West, and dispatched to fight the plots of a wide range of colorful villains like Mistress Pavlov and Porkzilla. Funnily enough, West also voices a human character in the show named Gordon. I just found it amusing that Batman voices Gordon. Anyway, I know I compared it to Road Rovers, but it was actually pretty clever and able to stand on its own. Plus, one of those villains was a parody of James Bond's staple Blofeld, named Ernst Stavro Blowfish, and voiced by Ben Stein, which on its own probably makes it worth watching. But let's leave our planet behind for a while and take a look at a handful of shows taking place in the depths of space instead. The first series we run into out in the inky void of the galaxy is a new property out of Canada, as so many have been so far in this half of the decade. This one is called Shadow Raiders, and is somewhat based on a toy line called War Planets, which were little playsets kind of like Mighty Max or some of the older Micro Machines. The show was developed by the creative team behind Reboot, and done in the same CGI art style as that one had been. The series is about a quartet of planets engaged in an ongoing four-way war over specific resources that are unique to each. There's an uninhabited planet in the same star cluster, though, which one day shows signs of life and begins attacking and destroying other planets. Now the warring factions of rock, fire, ice, and bone need to form an alliance to stand against the aggressive forces of the beast planet. The series lasted for two seasons and a total of 26 episodes through syndication here in the US, but one of the most egregious examples of the 30-minute toy commercial was cancelled before a planned season 3 because of poor toy sales, even though the show itself was generating decent ratings. As long as we're talking about CGI though, let's take a look at a new take on some 80s royalty with Voltron the Third Dimension. The show was... Well, it was Voltron. Do we really need to recap Voltron? Yeah, I didn't think so. 
The series was essentially a direct sequel to the beloved original, and starts with Prince Lotor, now voiced by SPACE, escaping from prison. This, in turn, leads to the reformation of the Voltron Force, three-fifths of which were still voiced by their original voice actors, with only Hunk and Pidge being replaced. It was actually a pretty decent series and successor for the Voltron story, but it got a lot of hate for the animation and designs of the characters and technology, even though Voltron itself stayed pretty true to the original. The show got 26 episodes over two syndicated seasons. Our last spacefaring adventure to chat about was another entry in the surge of Marvel comic shows that we received here in the mid-90s with Silver Surfer, which ran for a single 13-episode season this year on Fox Kids. The show took inspiration, but deviated in some significant ways, from the comics, starting out with the Surfer's origin but telling a version of it involving Thanos and Ego the Living Planet instead of the Fantastic Four. From there, it's a basic spacefaring adventure guest starring several other Marvel space characters as the Surfer searches for his faintly remembered home and lost love, Shallow Ball. It was okay, but the Surfer to me had always been one of those characters who's so powerful that it's hard to do interesting stories for him. The absolute best thing about the show wasn't the plots, though, but rather the animation, which combined hand-drawn art and computer effects to pretty faithfully reproduce the style of the amazing Jack Kirby. It was always pretty cool to see how well they were able to really bring those designs to life. Let's stick with superheroes, but bring things back down to Earth to the embattled city of Townsville in one of the absolute most classic series this year brought us, The Powerpuff Girls. This was such a great show, and a clever deconstruction of the superhero genre as a whole. Children with superpowers had been done before, but they'd never been preschoolers, and they'd never had all the responsibility of defending an entire city dropped on them. Fortunately for the girls, most of the villains they faced were usually somewhat incompetent or barely a threat, with some notable exceptions like him and occasionally Mojo Jojo. The conflict with the villains were usually just there as more of a B-plot to the real message or story about family or responsibility or some other deeper concept anyway, though. Between the real-world problems wrapped in kaiju battles or superhero antics, the pop culture references, and the mostly hilarious character designs and representations throughout, it deserves to be recognized as a true classic of the era. It got 78 episodes across six seasons on Cartoon Network, plus a handful of specials, a movie, eventually an anime, several video games, and even a reboot back in 2016. Next up, I want to mention the one and only tokusatsu show we got this year, as it kind of closed out the era overall, and we really wouldn't be seeing them anymore the same way we did here in the 90s. Okay, so it's not tokusatsu the same way Power Rangers is, but more in that American implementation of tokusatsu concepts and design. It's called Mystic Knights of Tirnanog, and changed things up by being a period piece set in medieval Ireland and based somewhat on actual Irish mythology. The series is about an evil queen who magically summons a string of monsters in an attempt to take over the kingdom of Kells. However, four young warriors venture into the fabled enchanted forest of Tirnanog, and within it are presented a series of challenges by King Finvara. After passing these trials, they're granted control of the elements, one to each, and the ability to summon powerful armor and weapons they use to battle the invading monsters. The show actually had a lot going for it, and I love the Celtic feeling design of it, not to mention the somewhat classic nature of the monsters in the series. In my opinion, it was a pretty decent high point for the 90s live-action team shows to end on. It ran for a single 50-episode season on Fox Kids. Lastly, though, we'll close out the year with the biggest, most impactful series that IT saw released, and the one I'm sure you've all been waiting for, Pokemon. I've talked about not really having to say much about some of the other shows that we got this year, but I kind of feel like that statement applies to this series more than any other. I'm not sure there has ever been another phenomenon quite like Pokemon, as far as its global reach, cultural impact, and longevity. The series currently stands at 1,259 episodes across its 26 variations on the air, and it's still growing, currently running uninterrupted since this year. According to the official corporate site of the Pokemon Company, the franchise has shipped over 480 million units of software in nine languages, produced over 52.9 billion trading cards in 14 languages that are sold in 89 countries, and aired the animated series in an astounding 192 countries around the world since its launch. Considering that there are 195 entities in the world recognized as countries, even considering shifting geopolitical landscapes over the past 25 years, that's super impressive. So yeah, if you're not familiar with Pokemon, then I have no idea how you've managed to avoid it. But if that is the case, welcome to our little planet. We're happy to have you here. Please excuse the mess. Now, as we usually do, let's go through and take a look at where these shows can be watched as of October 2023. There's a hefty number of them this year that never saw an official release of any kind to start with. 
That list includes The Fantastic Voyages of Sinbad, Invasion America, The Lion Hearts, Salty's Lighthouse, Bad Dog, Mad Jack the Pirate, Monster Farm, The Secret Files of Dogs, Toonsylvania, Voltron the Third Dimension, and The Mystic Knights of Tiernanog. Others had a DVD release at one point, but are now out of print, including Celebrity Deathmatch, Donkey Kong Country, Franklin, Chucklewood Critters, and Shadow Raiders. A decent handful can be watched on streaming, with both Tubi and Pluto TV having Animal Crackers, Ned's new Pippi Longstocking, Donkey Kong Country, which is also on Prime, and Pocket Dragon Adventures, which is also on Peacock. Disney Plus has a few of this year's series available, like Silver Surfer, Hercules the Animated Series, and PB&J Otter. And a couple like Pokemon and the Powerpuff Girls can be seen on Netflix, with PPG also on HBO Max. Or I guess, just Max now. Robocop Alpha Commando is on the Roku channel, and Space Goofs can be watched with a Sling subscription. Beyond those, Cat Dog, Celebrity Deathmatch, Franklin, Oh Yeah Cartoons, Pinky Elmira and the Brain, and the Wild Thornberries can be bought digitally from several different sources. As for DVDs, there aren't many series from this year available in that format. Just Cat Dog, Godzilla the Series, Hysteria, Pinky Elmira and the Brain, the Wild Thornberries, and Pokemon in that group. With Best Buy recently announcing that they weren't even going to carry DVDs anymore, I imagine that collecting series like these is only going to keep getting harder, so get them while you can. And with that, we can go ahead and close the book on 1998. There was some good stuff in here, and even a couple of bona fide classics, but overall it feels a little weaker than a lot of the others we've covered this decade. We'll have to see if that keeps up next year and the decade fizzles out, like the 80s did, or if those 50 series I cover in 1999 are going to put it in the front of the pack. Regardless of which situation we end up in, I'll be talking about that in the summary video at the decade's wrap-up. Let me know your thoughts on this year and hopes for next in the comments. Make sure to check out some of my other new video series and keep an eye out for even more content coming over the next few months, as well as some announcements about other ventures in the community posts. Thanks for watching everyone. Stay tuned and stay tuned, as in cartoons. Later.